Hello, my name's Dr. Jonathan Hargreaves. I'm a lecturer in acoustical and audio engineering and a researcher in computational acoustics at the Acoustics Research Group at the University of Salford in the UK. Uh, and this is a talk I gave at Internoise 2022 in Glasgow, but which wasn't recorded. So I'm just giving it again here as a little screencast. And the subject of this is a comparison between the high frequency boundary element method and what is called surface based geometrical acoustics. So first off, a quick outline. Uh, I'm going to talk quite a bit about the motivation and vision for this because this is kind of quite a forward looking paper, um, sort of thinking about how things might be in five or ten years, I suppose. Um, so I'm going to talk quite a bit about that, what the, uh, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the algorithm framework, the similarities between these two algorithms I've mentioned, high frequency boundary element method and surface based geometrical acoustics. Then I'm going to talk about boundary sensing and radiation as an example of where there might be some synergies. I'm going to talk about mappings to and from sources and receivers, again looking at where there might be synergies. And then finally I'll draw some conclusions and discuss where I think all the future work in this exciting area is going. So probably the main motivation is oralization. And oralization is all about listening to sound, sounds of buildings, sounds of I don't know, potentially vehicles, cars, anything you can imagine really. Uh, and rather than just sort of having some numbers that quantify um, in, in some opaque way how good something sounds, you actually listen to it. You actually get stakeholders to listen to it. And what's going on in this picture, uh, which is from a, a sound lab by Arup, that's what they call their, their facility, the sound lab, and they were one of the pioneers in, in doing this. What's going on here? is that we have a, a chap sat on the stool in the middle who's a stakeholder who's got to make some sort of decision about some acoustic treatment in a building that's going to be built and then we have a consultant uh, stood on the left here who's having a conversation with them about whether the design and what they're hearing is going to be fit for purpose is it actually going to work or not and this helps people who might not have thought about acoustics but would actually be impacted by by its design make informed decisions on whether things are fit for purpose or not. And this, this is a great methodology, it's a great way of engaging stakeholders and, and driving really high quality decisions. But in order for it to be actually achieved in the first place, you have to have something to listen to. And in order for it actually to be valid, really the data should be accurate as well. So this requires, this produces a need for full audible bandwidth room acoustic simulation. And we have types of room acoustic simulation, but this full audible bandwidth thing is kind of the sticking block. So presently we have very good methods for low frequencies, uh, and this is where the wavelength um, is quite long compared to obstacles. I'm sort of drawing this abstract kind of square obstacle here, and we can see a wave with areas of low and uh, positive and negative pressure in red and blue, kind of propagating around that and, and diffracting a little bit. Um, so you get the kind of the idea that the wavelength is probably about two thirds of the size of the obstacle here. Um, and in this kind of range, wave behavior is absolutely crucial. Things like diffraction, interference, absolutely, you, you know, you, you can't solve it without taking those into account. And they're absolutely paramount. A high, very, very high frequencies, on the other hand, sound propagates approximately geometrically, that is in straight lines. Uh, and the kind of, sort of de facto way of visualizing this is with rays or little these little arrows, these little directional arrows or rays of sound. And um, they will come in from some certain direction, PI, instant, the direction of the instant wave. Um, and then you'll get start getting phenomenon like you'll get shadow zones behind the obstacle where the sound simply doesn't go because something was in the way. Um, a lot of this language is carried over from, from computer graphics, actually, which is where these algorithms come from. Uh, or you might get reflections off, say, the surfaces at the front, which are colored teal in these. So you get these sort of distinct reflections. And these algorithms are very different. Um, uh, but oralization requires data for the entire audible bandwidth all together in one output format. If you're going to listen to it, you need both of these. Uh, and you need them working together. And one sort of easy solution to that is say, oh, well, we know how to do this because we know how to do things with speakers and woofers and tweeters. Let's just use a crossover and we'll take these two methods that work at these two extremes and we'll kind of cut and shunt them together and then fade one into the other somehow. And that is being done. People do that. And that is certainly better than many other options. Uh, but it's certainly not ideal um, because if you both of these 
algorithms have, tr have problems. And the, one, the low frequency one has increasing computational cost as you go up in frequency. So it's going to get very ex computationally expensive, very fast. You're going to suddenly need a massive computer with massive amounts of memory and it's uh, going to take ages to solve. Whereas from the other direction, uh, you've got these high frequency methods that are very fast to compute, but they're approximate, and that approximation becomes more important the lower you go in frequency. So they only approximately include wave effects such as interference and diffraction, if they even include them at all. And then finally, this sort of question about the crossover, you know, is this robustly accurate? Is this perceptually ad ad adequate or not? Um, just sort of cutting and shunting these two totally uh, two algorithms that have totally different models of sound together, and uh, it kind of maybe sometimes, but but particularly for early reflections arriving that have very distinct um, kind of characteristics and are very important perceptually, I think not. Um, I've certainly seen examples where this has led to some quite peculiar kind of artifacts. So I would say that this is not okay. So the question then is what instead and the important thing to realize is that this distinction into low and high frequency models is kind of arbitrary and it's just driven by the algorithms we have and the, the physics of sound is actually a continuous spectra and we have this mid frequency region where the waves have sort of lead in order geometrical behavior but they're still waves they're still joined up with diffraction there's still interference going on um, and this is a picture here uh, just of a simulation where that's been done the, the sort of uh, frequency has been wound up so the wavelength gets smaller and suddenly you start to see regions that mimic what's going on in the geometrical model we start to get we get a shadow zone at the back now it's not got a kind of like clear hard boundary um, because it's sort of joined in by diffraction and then we see these kind of interference regions these sort of spotty bits which are due to interference of the instant wave with the reflections off the front and top surface so actually we've got these distinct reflections and they're, they're actually showing up and they're identifiable now. So actually if you wind up the um, the low frequency algorithms, algorithms this stuff does emerge but it would just be too computationally intensive to do. So we're looking for kind of algorithms that pick out this lead and order behavior and can kind of let us find some synergy between the low and the high frequencies. And again I would um, argue this is particularly important for, for early reflections. Um, and you can see a little reflectogram here of um, sound reflections in a room, sound pressure level versus time, and you kind of get the direct sound, and you get to these certain sparse early reflections um, before the diffuse stuff comes in. And, and you know, the perception of the diffuse waves is important. Uh, we characterize that with reverberation time, which is probably the most important room acoustic uh, single sort of metric parameter, uh, but it's not a detailed one, it doesn't tell us anything about all this detail that's going on down there, which is what you'd be computing, it just tells you how fast it decays. So, you know, in terms of human listeners, the fine detail by that point is not very important anymore. So it's really these sparse early reflections we've got to worry about. And existing high frequency geometrical methods distinguish between early and late time for this reason, to do with reflection density. So they'll typically run a deterministic method such as beam tracing or image source for these sparse early reflections. And then later on where things get chaotic, they won't bother trying to track all those reflections anymore. They'll use something stochastic like ray or particle tracing. And um, we need a kind of transition kind of um, process to get energy out of the early time algorithm into the late time chaotic one and that again is something that, that is existing. If we kind of turn this into a spectrogram and think about frequency 2, um, so we've kind of got now got time versus the on the horizontal axis and frequency with the vertical axis, we can sort of divide this up more into little zones um, and we can say that actually the low frequencies need to be done differently and one of the reasons they need to be done differently is that they have low modal density. So whereas at high frequencies often, particularly early time, you get a sort of like low reflection density in this sparsity in time. At low frequencies in a space, you actually get sparsity with modes and certain frequencies will behave very differently from other frequencies and that's very important. And that's why you need solvers like uh, boundary element method BEM or finite element method FEM or finite difference time domain FTDD, um, which actually solve the wave equation directly and capture all this stuff. And I so say that's because of the low modal density. Um, 
and that is this is where you've essentially put in the crossover that I was talking about. Um, and towards the latter part of this, you know, the I don't think there's perhaps so much of an issue bridging BEM FEM FTDD with chaotic ray particle tracing at the end. I mean, as I said, by that point, we're only you know, the human listeners are only thinking about the general envelope of the decay anyway. Where things are particularly critical, I think, is um, that the very early time here indicated by this red line where actually you've got these sparse reflections. And if you're modeling them totally differently uh, in the high frequency regime and in the low frequency regime, which is what's going on at the minute, then there's almost certainly going to be some weirdness going on when you actually try and join these two things back up again. So basically my proposal, my vision here is that we slice this slightly differently and rather than slicing it uh, just by frequency and then the top half by time, we slice everything by time and then the late part by frequency. So I'm after a an algorithm for full audible bandwidth room acoustic simulation but with the significant caveat that I only expect this to be achievable for early time for early reflections. Um, you know, it'd be nice to think that you would have one for the full impulse response. And, and to be fair, people are running things like finite difference time domain on massive great GPU farms and using loads and loads of electricity and waiting days or weeks for an answer. Um, but but we know actually that the, the late time there's these chaotic energy methods and things that actually work very well. So so why not why not use those? Um, and really the problem is at the, the early time in my opinion. So I want to see a, a a unified full audible bandwidth algorithm for room acoustic simulation at early time for early reflections and then possibly some sort of different adapted existing methods for late time. And I think the most the best candidate for early time is what I've called high frequency BEM uh, which has been a lot of research done on um, particularly sort of groups in the UK like Reading notably and in, in, at UCL and also in other uh, different universities and in, in Europe too, um, and then there's also this other area called what is what Svensson and Saviola in their review paper called surface-based geometrical acoustics, that rather than considering these rays passing around the volume independently, we think about when they hit a surface. So we think about sort of exchanges from boundary to boundary of energy instead, and and these. Uh, are definitely gaining interest. There's at least three different groups looking at these kind of in independent ways. Um, and the reason I pick these all out really is that they're all commonly stated as what you call boundary integrals or boundary element methods. So, so low frequency BEM in green is obviously a boundary element method. High frequency BEM in, in yellow is obviously a boundary element method. And what we'll see in this talk is that surface based geometrical acoustics is essentially a boundary element method as well. So, for the purpose of this talk, finally getting to the end of the motivation, after about 13 minutes, um, we're talking about energy exchange from deterministic high frequency BEM into this sort of chaotic surface based geometrical acoustics. So, let's try and think about some commonality. Um, I'm going to think about the framework of these algorithms because we're going to see that it's going to be the same. And essentially, what we're dealing with is we're dealing with Two two domains. We're dealing with some air the, in in the room, or whatever air the sound is travelling through. Uh, and then there's going to be some sort of material, um, and then there's going to be some boundary between that. And I've drawn this just as a kind of like flat material with air above it. But we, you know, you could think of this being any geometry or collection of sort of obstacles or air around you know, a boundary enclosing a room or anything. I've just drawn this like this for diagrammatic purposes. And within the um, air domain, there's going to be some sort of source, which is where sound's coming from. Um, the data associated with that is, of course, the sound outgoing at the source. So, so in terms of data, we're going to need to represent the sound outgoing from the source. Then we're going to have to represent the propagation behavior as sound propagates acoustically through the air, so our wave physics come in. And then um, what happens next? Well, we get some sound incoming at the boundary. We need to represent that somehow as well. What can happen to that sound incoming at the boundary? Well, it can get absorbed into the materials and, and, and never come back. Uh, or it could get scattered. So uh, I'm going to use the word scattered here to kind of um, mean any combination of sort of reflection that might be uh, what you call specular, kind of 
following Snell's law, like light off a mirror, but also kind of scattering in a broader sense, like sound goes off in all directions. So, so for me, specular reflections are a, um, a special case of scattering, where it goes in one particular direction. Similarly, I won't actually worry about absorption here, because from the purposes of the acoustic model, absorption is simply sound that wasn't scattered. So we can get rid of the absorption error. So now we've found the sound outgoing at the boundary from the sound incoming. That's our second set of uh, data on the boundary. Uh, and then that's going to propagate off and it might propagate back to the boundary in some other part of the boundary. But in this diagram, I'm going to show it's done like it's done a U-turn. Um, and that's going to happen many times. Uh, we're going to repeat this little loop many, many times. These are sort of reflection orders. And then we're going to sum their effect. And you see this in uh, time domain boundary method, which is what my PhD was in about 15 odd years ago. And um, they're actually solved by doing what you call marching on in time, where you kind of time step and you, a bit like finite difference time domain, you sort of gradually, very, very slowly move on in time and track all these waves and things talking to one another. Um, but actually, you can show that you can set them up, uh, even in the frequency, frequency domain, to work in terms of reflection order. So you, you see these distinct reflections coming off certain uh, bodies, as is being shown in this little animation. And in particular, we note that the we get second order reflections here. So the blue hits the second panel, makes a sort of tealy color one. The green hits the panel on the right, makes a yellow reflection. So again, we're getting reflections of reflections. And that's what this loop is doing. And then, um, what else might we have? Well, we might have receivers, um, like our person listening in our oralization, receiving the sound, wanting to hear that. Uh, so we're going to sum these things over the um, all the possible reflection orders, and then we're going to propagate that out, and the date, final set of data we're trying to represent is sound incoming, arriving at the receiver. So that is our algorithm framework, and this is how uh, surface-based geometrical acoustics is typically set up. Uh, so um, one of my students, uh, Mal Mthias, has published a conference paper in the same proceedings where he's talked in a lot more detail about our little algorithm we've written for that. And then I have a 2019 wave motion paper where I've shown that you can write boundary element method in the same way and, and looked at that. Um, and um, one of the things if you're doing this right is you should find that the uh, propagation operator is symmetrical, that if you sort of go sound out coming from one part of the boundary and arriving somewhere else should be the same as sound coming from that second part of the boundary going backwards, you know, it's just bi-directional, it's symmetrical. And you should also find if you do things properly that sound from the source to the boundary and sound from the boundary to the receiver are what you call reciprocal, that if you again swap the directions that they, they end up being the same thing. And that is something I showed in a 2019 JARSA paper for boundary element method. So that's one of our principles for surface-based doing surface-based geometrical acoustics properly too. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. So let's first of all have a quick comparison of these two algorithms. Uh, I've not actually introduced these to a great degree yet, so let's just talk through some of their features. So high frequency BEM, like any BEM, will use a boundary mesh. Uh, it will discretize pressure because we're interested in, in phases, um, sort of deterministically. Um, the solution is built from distributions of simple sources on the boundary. So that what that means is sort of sums of distributions of monopoles and dipoles on the boundary. That's, that's all of what BEM is, actually. Um, and this exactly satisfies the Helmholtz equation. So that's why it's such a beautiful and powerful, powerful algorithm. Um, so all that so far is the same as standard boundary element method. If you want to say what I would call high frequency boundary element method, then the thing, the added sort of bit that you throw in now is that you say you're not going to just use standard elements and standard polynomial interpolating functions. We'll actually use oscillatory functions to interpolate pressure on the mesh. And the mathematicians who are interested in this look at this because it has certain attractive properties in terms of how fast these methods converge and, and how quickly they get accurate answers. Um, but for me, I'm particularly interested because they have a beam forming effect. Uh, and that means that actually you're implicitly discretizing with respect to wave direction as well as position. So in my papers on this, you'll see sort of a sort of double summation of, of different degrees of freedom and some of them to do with spatial behavior, like different elements on the mesh. Uh, 
and some of them are to do with directionality like different directions the wave might be going in. Over to surface based geometrical acoustics this also uses a boundary mesh uh, it doesn't discretize pressure it discretizes power uh, it's not built from distributions of simple sources it's built from distributions of rays but they are also emanating from the boundary so we've got some synergy in terms of the boundary there uh, and it approximately satisfies the Helmholtz equation better more so at high frequencies uh, and this oops, explicitly discretizes with respect to wave direction as well as position so what have we got uh, in terms of similarities so we're using boundary meshes we're discretizing with respect to wave direction as well as position so that kind of um, suggests we, we you know a lot of synergy already in terms of how these algorithms are operating and representing the solution that they uh, of whatever problem they're trying to solve but there are some differences um, whether you discretize in pressure or power um, whether you exactly or approximately satisfy the Helmholtz equation so I'll come back to that one at the end and just to kind of like illustrate this framework a little bit more uh, and I didn't put this slide in my presentation at Internoise actually but I'll do it now um, just to link to the papers on this um, I'm just going to say a little bit more about this data so if you think about the data coming at the source you're going to have some stack of coefficients which I'll call WS for source being all the coefficients representing the source data um, if you got some data going to receiver there's going to be some sort of stack of coefficients in little vector WR R for receiver receiving um, whatever's coming out of this and then um, we're going to need to discretize, this, discretize and represent in the computer the sound at the boundary too and um, people might do historically have often done both of these together they've just said something like total pressure would be equal to whatever it is over a load of elements um, but I find it really useful in terms of these synergies and seeing what's going on and thinking about early reflections to do incoming and outgoing separately and also to sum them over reflection order so here I've got a summation so so I've got W minus so I, I tend to call incoming minus because um, you have a little vector called the normal vector that points uh, out into the uh, air from the boundary uh, in BEM and these are going in the opposite direction to the to, to that so a kind of negated direction so that's why the minus sign appears so they're the incoming and I here is reflection order so we sum in a sort of coefficients uh, um, with overall reflection orders so we can find each of those separately um, and then uh, we're doing the same thing for outgoing sound so that's now plus because it's going in the same direction as a little vector and um, what we can see is that actually we, we then get this set of matrix equations that tells us how to solve all these little bits so this is again in the paper uh, you find that the zeroth order incoming wave w0 minus is um, this funny thing called a mass matrix which is a kind of like normalization thing it's going to turn up in all these equations I'm afraid uh, you can sort of ignore it it's for normalization purposes and then one that's sort of a propagation matrix TSB so source to boundary multiplied by the original source data WS so actually that whole propagation operation has just become a matrix multiplication by TSB um, so now we know incoming W minus for zero uh, for I equals zero the zero order of reflection the first arrival uh, we need to find outgoing from incoming so we've got to have an equation that says that we can find the outgoing W plus for the whatever reflection order we're thinking of WI um, from again this mass matrix is normalization term with a, what we'd now call a reflectance matrix R and then the sound energy that came in WI minus for this reflection order that's going to give us our outgoing data for this particular reflection order and then that might go one of two places it might loop back um, and now we get the the fact that the incoming wave W minus for I the next reflection order is the outgoing one for the previous reflection order so W plus I minus 1 and then with this little transmission matrix TBB as in boundary to boundary that represents the propagation uh, through the medium so again propagation through the medium sounds like a very complicated thing but in this case it's just a matrix multiplication we have to find out what data is in the matrix obviously but in terms of algorithmically it's just multiplied by a matrix
So if you're kind of familiar with matrix algebra at all, you can hopefully see that this is just kind of create this kind of summation where we, we, we do the equation on the top left to get the first zero of data in, then we go around the little orange loop and then round the top green loop and we just keep on doing that round and round, multiplying matrices and find all these reflection orders for as far as we want to go through that time history getting these early reflections. And then finally we add all those up uh, and then we find the sound at the receiver using another propagation matrix TBR, so boundary to receiver. Um, and as I said before, you know, you, you, the, the propagation from boundary to boundary should be uh, symmetric, so we find that TBB is symmetric, and then the source to boundary and the boundary to receiver should be reciprocal, so we find that actually TSB and TBR are conjugate transposes of each other as well. So there you go, there's a load of, there's a kind of diagrammatic form of the equations that are in the paper, so uh, if the, Hopefully that, that helps build that little picture a bit. If it didn't, then don't worry too much. Um, so let's just focus next on what actually bit, go back more to sort of physical explanation. Think about what's going on at the boundary. So I'm going to focus on, uh, in on these two processes here. Think about how we, we represent those, what's going on. And in terms of these... Uh, what these need to do, the, uh, we need a process that maps whatever sound is arriving uh, either from other parts of the boundary, from sources, onto a predefined mesh of elements and a set of wave directions. And physically, the kind of synergy for that physically is a, a microphone array. Uh, so you may, have, you may have come across these, this is another area I'm really interested in. Um, that use a lot of the same processing actually, uh, are looking and using sort of sensing across the surface by sampling the pressure with microphones, or virtual microphones, and sort of beam forming to find where the sound came from so we get directional information too. For sound outgoing on the boundary, uh, we need a process that radiates sound uh, outgoing at the boundary out into the domain. And physically, again, this is rather like wave field synthesis, it's like loudspeaker arrays. It's, driving all these different parts of the boundary with slightly different amplitudes and phases and, and pushing off waves in different directions indicated by the orange arrows. So there's kind of physical manifestations of this and, and the processing for those is very similar to the processing for real boundary element method uh, with high frequency boundary element method with these oscillatory functions in it. But now we're trying to think about the synergy of that with geometrical acoustics and the thing about geometrical acoustics is you know, sound goes in straight lines, so it has this kind of perfection to it. There's no, there's no ambiguity where sound came from. You know, you've got a ray coming in. Which direction did it come from? Well, it came from that direction. You can literally, you know, you have the vector, you have the ray. You do some uh, geometry and you work out what angle it came from. So, super simple, no questions asked. In something else like high frequency BEM, you're going to get something more like getting microphone arrays where you get some sort of lobe of some finite width, possibly the side lobes as drawn here, depending on what exactly you, you did to that data um, when you process the microphone data. And it's going to have some width and some uncertainty to it. Same thing with the radiation. Geometrical acoustics radiates a perfect ray off in the intended direction, like a laser beam. Um, with no consideration of how big the radiating patch was, which you know, makes it simple and fast, but technically is wrong in terms of how acoustic waves actually behave. Something to do with BEM will behave more like a physical loudspeaker array, and the size of it uh, will have some effects. And again, we get some side lobes, we get some beam width. So the main peak should be going in the right direction, but we'll get some side lobes and beam width. So first of all, we'll just try and show that that's the case. And I took some data, I redid some calculations from my uh, 2019 wave motion paper to show that, using the techniques from that, to show this actually was the case and that this works. Um, and first of all, I just did a case where the, we're trying to radiate surface normal, um, so at zero degrees, kind of uh, perpendicular to the boundary. And here you see that when uh, Ka is one, so A here is the size of the, radiating element, K is wave number, so effectively blue is low frequency. Uh, then you get a kind of quite wide radiation, rather like a cardioid, uh, as you go to K equals 10, which is more like a mid frequency, then you get this kind of um, more sort of focus around the front, but still quite wide lobe, uh, and if you go to K equals 100, which would be quite high frequency, uh, so 
wavelength is much smaller than the, the radiating panel, you get quite a narrow lobe. And the important thing here is that they all point in the uh, intended geometrical direction indicated by the dashed arrow, and they all hit the correct amplitude at that angle. So there's some spreading, but beyond that, they're getting it right. So there is synergy between geometrical acoustics and these 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 BEM uh, these boundary element based uh, methods. Think about radiation 30 degrees normal to scattering. Um, again, so we've got the ray going out with a little dashed arrow. And we see again that the uh, the lowest frequencies with the blue, we get a lot of sort of smudging. Um, at the mid frequencies, we get some slightly different smudging. There's some sort of obvious asymmetry going on here. Uh, and then at um, k equals 100, we've got this very narrow beam again. And the asymmetry arises because actually what you're trying to do in these algorithms is eliminate what you call front-back confusion. If you can see those red arrows there, uh, you're trying to make sure you don't get confused between um, a ray kind of arriving from or going off in a certain direction and one that's kind of been mirror imaged in the surface. This is quite a common problem with um, plain and microphone arrays. Uh, and some of the processing I've looked at for high frequency BEM, which is based on flow of energy instead of just pressure, um, eliminates this rather nicely. So that's why they get these asymmetries. And if we actually look, um, oh yeah, so the other thing that we might look at is power flow from point source. So that was looking at the directionality. Let's look at the amount of power flowing out of it. And here we have a source. We know that as the wave is going to spread out in lots of directions, so that kind of implies that as, as you're getting further from the source, the, the power is spreading out, so the power density, which is acoustic intensity, is going to spread. Uh, so we would see um, in, I'll draw these things in in, um, uh, in 2D, because that's what the paper's in. Uh, so if we're looking at um, power for this, we would see that power would spread with 1 over R uh, in, in 2D. Um, because it's spreading out around a circle. So if you think about a source going to a mesh element, so you, you, it's kind of fairly obvious that these rays are going to spread out and diverge, and you can kind of see that this is maybe a little section of a circle, so you can kind of tell quite easily you're going to get 1 over R, par, one over R power spreading, just following the logic that this is a section of a circle. When the rays arrive at the element, they might not be completely perpendicular, so you'd also get a cos theta factor turn up here. But what about power flow to a receiver? So I said these were supposed to be kind of reciprocal effects, and this is I always felt this was a bit less obvious really. So uh, if you think about the mesh element here, and then you talk about sort of distributions of power versus angle on the element, well if you think of one angle, it just kind of makes sense that all those rays fire off in one direction, like uh, this collection of parallel laser beams, and uh, you stick a receiver in there somewhere, and okay seems sort of logical um, but if you look at that you find that you get the cos theta term but you don't get any distance scaling because all these rays are parallel so there's nothing going on with with distance and um, that is not reciprocal it's not correct uh, and again if you kind of follow this through in more detail and the difficult thing with geometrical acoustics is you often end up deciding what the algorithm is going to do quite heuristically because it's just you know, you've got these kind of abstract concepts like rays and stuff like that, which is sometimes difficult to see how they relate to real sound. The beauty of doing this in parallel with BEM is that you at least know that BEM definitely solves the wave equation. So if you get something that looks like the equivalent BEM statement, then you kind of know you're on the right track. So that's my rationale and method with all of this. And if you kind of follow that and you, you look at this, then you would find that these rays should therefore converge, uh, and that will give you the cos theta. And I'll actually give you the 1 over R as well. Might not be totally um, quite so obvious why when the rays are converging rather than diverging, but it does give you this 1 over R power rating. And really that's to do with, again, we see the reciprocity that we get the spreading out from the source. If you go to the receiver, we should be thinking of rays converging at receiver. So again, these processes are reciprocal. We've just time reversed and flipped the direction of propagation. And um, <clears throat> 
if we want to just check that they do follow these 1 over R trends, then I've done this for a few different frequencies here. So I've got my 1 over um, square root R now, because actually some, this is a plot for pressure magnitude here, uh, whereas I was talking about power uh, on the previous slide, which is proportional to the, to, the, to the square of this, so 1 over R. Now we've square rooted 1 over square root R. Uh, and if you look at this for a few different frequencies, you find that uh, the uh, the lowest frequencies, oh sorry, not, not the lowest frequencies, that the um, closest to the source, so the horizontal scale here is distance from the source, receiver radius, normalized to the size of the thing that you're radiating from, uh, and then pressure magnitude normalized up the vertical scale. If you look at these, you see that, uh, uh, that for k equals 1 low frequencies, you pretty much just get in spherical spreading all the time, because the wavelengths much longer than whatever was generating the sound but with ka equals 10 and k equals, particularly k equals 100 you you start to have the capability to have these beam forming effects and if you're beam forming then that's like the laser beams all going out parallel um, and you get this kind of like little flat plateau region in the near field where you can in the near field at least radiate something that looks like it's a plane wave um, but as you get further away the finite size of the source kind of kicks in and then it it rolls off and you can see here that all these lines um, actually converge on top of each other with this normalization but also most importantly they all are parallel to this order 1 over square root r line so we actually see that they all follow this trend so the logic with the picture drawing and the arrows on the previous slide is actually what you get if you do the cold hard maths and the integrals and all the rest of it so this is actually a really uh, it was a reassuring result that I think explains this quite nicely final little thing on synergies uh, before I draw some conclusions is just to look at how you might decompose some of these radiation patterns so this is a radiation pattern um, from an element with one of these sort of beam forming basis functions on it and you can see that it's kind of pushing a main low about up to the top right and there's, there's some ways you can decompose these kind of radiation patterns uh, and the first one's what's called the Maggie Rubinovitz decomposition which is a very old uh, way of processing it from optics and that, what you're doing really there is you're, you're considering the element the black line in the diagram um, drawn as a blue trapezium down the bottom here uh, not trapezium, parallelogram and if you kind of imagine that, that shape being kind of extruded off in the propagation direction this creates this visibility region and that gives you a geometric beam, which is what's shown in the middle slide. Uh, and the correct solution, the thing that's actually a solution of Helmholtz equation on the left, the total, uh, is the geometric beam plus some correction. And this correction here is the classic thing that people call edge diffraction. You can see it's originated from the edges. You can also see that it, it has a flip of sign on the geometrical visibility boundary where the beam kind of kicks in and out. And it, it's exactly... I mean, it, causes some spreading, uh, but it also exactly compensates for that discontinuity in the geometrical beam where, you know, rays are perfectly visible or perfectly not visible, depending on where you are. Um, and it kind of joins at the solution and makes it all continuous, as we know that sound in the real world is. So that is um, quite encouraging. But like I said, we actually, when we look, think a bit harder, we realise that sound in these methods isn't actually going off in these beams with lots of parallel laser beams. It's actually doing something a bit more kind of conical. Um, and in that case, we move over. Oh, yes. So, so these actually algorithms have got different computation times as well. So, if you directly integrate um, the one on the left, it's it's slower than doing the other two bits on the right and adding them together. So that's what I looked at in 2016. But back, sorry, to the, um, the sort of conical behavior again. There's something else, uh, another decomposition, decomposition by a, a chap called John Asvestas. And what he showed is that actually what you can think about is what's called the solid angle. So if you imagine you draw like a little pyramid from the element up to the receiving point, and then you kind of chop off the top of the sphere, this little angle that you would sort of see cut out is called the solid angle. And this is... Uh, this is a 3D thing, uh, it's from a 2D part of a boundary, a surface, to a point in space, whereas my previous diagrams for, were kind of for a 2D world where the boundary is a line. Um, but this solid angle is kind of the 3D version of the cos theta I was talking about there. And the nice thing about that is that he showed that, again, you can decompose the real radiation into something that is a, 
a wave function times a solid angle and then some correction and the correction here doesn't have quite the same sort of neat in, uh, interpretation as being edge diffraction but it is mathematically these two things are mathematically still add up to the same correct answer and the really interesting thing here is that surface based geometrical acoustics computes these things with these solid angles if you're in 3D or cos or cos thetas if you're in, in 2D so actually again we actually find that we know what the correction is to add so to get the real correct surface uh, the, the real correct radiation so I said that BEM satisfies the Helmholtz equation, equation exactly surface based geometrical acoustics satisfies it approximately that would be the middle um, one and we actually know thanks to John Asvestas, what the difference is. So we can actually correct potentially surface-based geometrical acoustics and make it exact. And that is why I think we can create this unified early time algorithm. So here's some conclusions. Uh, thank you if you're still listening. This has obviously been a lot longer than it was when I uh, talked through it at a much faster pace in the conference. Um, so I've explored synergies between the high frequency boundary element method and surface-based geometrical acoustics. Uh, this was motivated by the desire to create a single, unified, full audible bandwidth simulation algorithm for early time. I've shown synergies in the algorithm structure, discretization schemes, so both elements and angles. We looked at the radiation patterns and showed how when frequency goes up, Ka gets large, they, they become very similar. We showed that the distance scaling is the same, um, 1 over R in uh, for, for, for power in 2D. Uh, we showed how both schemes satisfy reciprocity, constructed correctly, and we also looked at some correction factors from uh, Maggie Rubinovitz and Jonas Vestas. In terms of future work, I mean these are, let's be fair, these are early steps, as many challenges remain. Uh, the main aim of this paper is to inspire more interest in what I think is a very promising area here. And the kind of things that we might need to do is further analysis of what mathematicians call canonical problems, um, so in my work on high frequency BEM I've considered boundaries that are either planar or of constant radius which is kind of a bit easier but quite limiting. Um, we also need to consider edges like corners where two flat planes meet and then we need to also consider how these all join up. Uh, now in geometrical acoustics people don't really have to worry about this very much because as soon as you go to kind of thinking about rays it's like you imagine every boundary is in the far field of every other boundary but in boundary element method you can't assume that and you really have to take some care about how you build all these things together. Another thing we need to think about is efficient integration routines. Um, so BEM is cheap at low frequencies, uh, surface based geometrical acoustics is cheap at high frequencies um, but if you're going to use mid frequencies and join it up like the kind of extra bit on the right I was showing in the slides of the animations a minute ago then you're going to have to do some numerical integration and it could be quite challenging. So we need some good integration routines that will actually compute the difference between BEM and surface-based geometrical acoustics and stitch these together in a really nice way that's completely really uh, beautifully valid at early, for early reflections and things. And that's it, thank you very much, so thank you for listening um, and I hope you found that interesting.